But the mystery of the gospel and the important aspect of the gospel I want us to look at this thing is this. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Notice it's not Christ is our hope of glory. Christ is no hope if he's not in you. Salvation of the cross is not good news unless you accept it. It's only good news, it's only hope if Christ is in you and you are in Christ, if you are clothed in Him, if you are united with Him. It is in salvation with Christ that you find hope. Just acknowledging that Jesus existed, saying, oh yeah, the Bible's a decent book. It tells some good moral stories. I can agree with that. But I'm not going to follow Christ. I'm not going to commit my life to Him. You have no hope. You only have hope when Christ is in you, when you are in Christ, when you're united with Him and you have salvation in Him. That's the only time you have hope. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And Good morning. If you have your Bibles with you, I would encourage you to open to, I believe it's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that's where we're going to begin this morning. For those of you who are visiting with us this morning, we're very glad that you're here. We hope that our time of worship has been an encouragement to you, and we ask you to encourage us by sticking around if you're able and letting us get to know a little bit more about you. We enjoy getting to know our guests. Have you ever had one of those days? I mean, one of those really good days. Everything seems to be going right. Everything's going good at work. The family's happy. Everything's going well as far as that to-do list that seems to ever be increasing. You're getting some things done. It's just one of those really good days. It might have been a while since you've had one of those, but hopefully you've had at least a couple of those really good days. And inevitably, you'll sit down and you'll turn on the TV, you'll open up your phone, and look at your social media account or something, maybe you'll open the paper, and as you begin to look through the news of the day, your countenance just drops, right? Because it seems like at one moment everything was going good, and then you turn on the TV and you find out that the world is broken, everything's going uh, the wrong direction, we're on the verge of collapse of somewhere, something is going bad. And we have a tendency because of these bad news, because of the constant 24-hour around-the-world news cycles, we have a tendency to constantly be getting bombarded with bad news. And if we're not careful because of that, our countenance can drop. We can walk around defeated. We can walk around quite depressed. This morning, as we continue to seek to live biblically, I think it's important that we ask the question, should we as Christians be walking around defeated? Should this be our approach when we see the news, when we see things going wrong in our world? Should we walk around defeated? Well, I think Paul has something to tell us about this. And if you would, go ahead and open your Bibles there if you haven't already to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I think Paul encouraging words for us. He says, Now I want to remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, in which you now stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word that I preached to you, unless it was that you believed in vain. For I delivered to you of first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sin according with the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was risen on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve, And then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of all whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. As Paul is writing and finishing up his letter there to the church there in Corinth in his first letter, Paul reminds them of the gospel. He wants to remind them of the good news of what he has preached to them, of what they have believed in, in which they now stand, if indeed they hold fast, if indeed they have believed truthfully. He says, this is good news. And I want to remind you of the fact that this is things that really happened. He appeared to more than 500 at one time. He appeared to the 12. He even appeared to me as one who is untimely born, one who out of sync 
He says, but I'm grateful for this. And I have given to you this gospel message. Well, why, Paul? Why are you reminding us of this? Well, look there in verse 12 and following. He says, now if, we, now if Christ is proclaimed as risen from the dead, then how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? But if there is no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are found to be mis misrepresenting God. And because we testify about God that he raised Christ from the dead, whom he did not raise, if it is indeed true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised from the dead. And if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If, it Christ, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we of all people are to be pitied. Paul is addressing some misunderstandings of Scripture that the Corinthian church is dealing with. This concept that, well, there's not really a resurrection from the, from the dead, that we really won't be united with our loved ones in the afterlife. That's, that's just fairy tale stuff. And he says, well, if that's the case, then Christ never was raised from the dead. If we have no hope of a resurrection. And if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then your faith is futile. You're not actually saved from your sins. You're believing in vain. You might be able to say that you have hope in this life, that there's something that you can hold on to in this life, but there's really nothing to look forward to in the next. If that's the case, Paul says, then we of all people should be pitied because the Christian faith is one that we will be persecuted. We will receive criticism for this belief. There's no reason to live this way if Christ is not risen from the dead. There's no reason to be here on Sunday morning you should be in bed, resting, enjoying a day off. You shouldn't be here. But Paul doesn't leave it there. Look at what Paul says starting in verse 20. He says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man also comes the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ is the first fruits, and then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then when he comes to the end, when he delivers the kingdom of God, the Father after destroying every ruler and every authority and every power. Paul says, but the fact of the matter is Christ was raised from the dead. Our preaching is not in vain. We serve a risen Savior, and because of that, we have our sins forgiven. We not only have a hope in this life, something to hold on to in this life, but we have something to hold on to in the future. See, because of the empty tomb, we have hope. And the hope that a Christian has is not wishful thinking. It's based upon historical facts. Upon a real tomb that was at one point filled and is empty today, not because the dead body was removed, but because the dead body rose, what was once dead was now alive and walked out of its own accord. And that that's Christ. Showing that he did have the power over death. That is our hope. And I think it's important that we understand that biblical hope is not wishful thinking. It's confident assurance based upon facts. And I want to show you that this morning. I want us to look at what biblical hope is. Turn over to Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, Paul writing to the church there at Rome, I think addresses this very well. Starting in verse 18, he says, For I consider that the suffering of this present time is not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the Son of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hopes that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves 
who are the first fruits of the Spirit. We groan inwardly as we await eagerly the adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope at all. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not yet see, we wait with patience. There is so much there that we can look at. Let's see if we can get some of the, at least the highlights here. Paul lines out that we don't have wishful thinking in our hope. We have a confident assurance in our hope. But he also lays out that our hope is not something that we currently have a hold of. It's not something that we currently have or that we currently see. Hope is that thing off in the future that we know will happen. Right? Because hope that is seen is no hope at all. Right? Why would you hope for what you currently have, what you currently see? That's something you possess now. He says, instead, we have a hope of what is coming. We have an assurance of what is coming. And that's what helps us to get through the hard times. If we were to turn over to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, we would see the definition, the textbook definition of faith. And we normally kind of uh, link faith in with the same definition as hope. It's not conviction. It's not knowledge, it's a blind leap of faith, it's hope, it's, it's wishful thinking. But that's not how the Hebrew writer defines faith. He says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I want us to break that down for a minute. Assurance. If we have assurance of something, then it's not wishful thinking. It's not just smoke, right? It's something you can hold on to. It's something that you know. I have assurance of something. I know it will be, right? That's the concept of assurance. The other word that's associated here is conviction. If you have conviction, it denotes the concept of evidence, something that you have based that confidence upon. Something that you have based that conviction upon. The Hebrew writer defines faith as the assurance, the, the a conviction, the, the con, you're, you're confident of what is not yet. Conviction, denoting evidence, the concept of I have proof of what's going to be. I haven't yet seen it. I don't yet have hold of it, but I know it's there. So a Christian's faith then is not just wishful thinking and hoping and, and leaping out in faith that there's something there. It's a confident knowledge of something being there. And it's not just faith in just anything. We have, con we have faith in the hope that is coming. So in a very real sense, both the Hebrew writer and Paul define both faith and hope as confidence, as assurance of something that we know will be. Not wishful thinking. We don't have wishful thinking that one day maybe there's actually possibly a heaven. We know there's a heaven. We know that one day we will be with Christ. We know that He's coming back. No, we don't yet have it. We don't yet possess it. We have seen it. But we have evidence. We have things that we base our faith upon that lead us to the conclusion, the logical conclusion, that what we are hoping and longing for is real. That's what we have in Christ. That's what we as Christians have. And returning back to Romans chapter 8, Paul says, based upon that, as I look at these momentary troubles, they may be huge, they may last a lifetime, but as I look at the trials and the troubles that I face in this world, as I turn on the news and I go, okay, what are we going to do now? I understand, based upon my faith, based upon the hope that I have, that it's only for a moment, and that in the long term of things, it may not even matter. Because I know who holds tomorrow. I know that God is on the throne. I know that Christ is coming. And because of that, I have a confident hope. And I can face the troubles of this world, not depressed, not defeated, but with hope. Now, that doesn't mean that these trials that we go through are not real. 
It doesn't mean that they're not hard. Right? You get a diagnosis, a diagnosis of cancer. Th that might just be world rocking. But once we pick ourselves up off the ground from hearing that news, we know that if nothing else, if God chooses not to heal us of that, I have hope that I will spend eternity with Him. I know that, I, that eternally, in the end of all things, God will work it together for good. If nothing else, my salvation. If nothing else, He will do that. We think of the story of Job, right? He never got an answer for why. It's not black and white. But we know who God is. We trust Him. And in the end, that's what Job came to an understanding of. He raised his fist and said, Why, God, I demand an audience. God showed up. All right, you want to question me? Let me ask you a few simple questions, just introductory things. Do you understand why the horse frolics about like he does, that he is just ready to go for battle? Do you understand any of that? What about this other creature over here? What about this other creature over here? Do you understand how the, the whole rain cycle works? Do you understand how the universe was created? When you answer those questions, then I will address yours. And Job went, I've opened my mouth once, and I will be silent. Twice and not again. He came to understand who God was. He came to trust who God is. Turn over to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians wrestling this concept. Look at what he says. So we do not lose heart, though our outer selves are wasting away. Our inward self is re being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look, not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Paul is calling us to have an eternal perspective. Now, once again, it doesn't mean that we need to make light of what's going on today. Things are hard. And for us to act otherwise is not honest. For us to face cancer and to say, oh, it don't matter. Good. Christ is on the throne. Okay, yeah, but can you be human for a moment? Can you be honest with me and say, yeah, this is scary, this is hard, and I don't know what's going to happen? When you're facing foreclosure on your home, when you're looking down the barrel of, I don't got a job, this is hard. That's why the body of Christ exists. But through all of that, we need to be able to step back, and instead of being defeated by all of that, we lean on one another, and we look eternally, and we say, you know what, despite everything that's going on, as hard as it is, as scared as I am, as, as just frustrated as I am with my situation, I know that one day I will be in heaven with Christ. And I will look back on this and I will say, you know what, it doesn't even Because the hundred years that I lived on earth is nothing in comparison to eternity with Christ. It doesn't discount what's going on now. It doesn't mean we put on a face of, oh, everything is hunky-dory. But it does mean that we have hope to face tomorrow. We understand that God is the one who is in control. God is the one who is on the throne. And I don't have to worry. I don't have to sit in angst. I may not understand what's going on. I might not have answers for why God is doing it the way that He's doing it. I might not understand why God is not intervening in the way that I think He should. But in the end, I know that He's in control. And I understand the fact of the matter is that nobody makes it out of this world alive. And if my end is tomorrow, then yay, Jesus. And I feel sorrowful for the ones left behind. And if a loved one perishes tomorrow... We'll mourn with you. We'll, we'll grieve. But we don't grieve like the rest of the world. We grieve with hope because we will one day be reunited because we know that there is more than this life alone. And that gives us hope. That sets us apart from the world. Look over at Colossians chapter 1. I think this is an important point when we're looking at this concept of our hope. Writing to the church there at Corinth, he says, 
To them God chose to make known the great, great among the Gentiles are the riches of His glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Paul's explaining to the church that there's this mystery that was being revealed to the prophets. That the Gentiles would receive the gospel, and aren't we glad? But the mystery of the gospel and the important aspect of the gospel I want us to look at this thing is this. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Notice it's not Christ is our hope of glory. Christ is no hope if He's not in you. Salvation of the cross is not good news unless you accept it. It's only good news. It's only hope if Christ is in you and you are in Christ. If you are clothed in Him. If you are united with Him. It is in salvation with Christ that you find hope. Just acknowledging that Jesus existed. Saying, oh yeah, the Bible's a decent book. It tells some good moral stories. I can agree with that. But I'm not going to follow Christ. I'm not going to commit my life to Him. You have no hope. You only have hope when Christ is in you. When you are in Christ. When you're united with Him and you have salvation in Him. That's the only time you have hope. It's Christ in you. The hope of glory. And we have a confident hope for those of us who have accepted that message. And we know that one day, confidently, that we will walk through those pearly gates. We know. We don't hope in the sense of wishful thinking. We have confident Christian hope that it will one day happen. We don't know when, we don't know how, but we know it will. Let's look at another passage real quick. Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 3, starting in verse 22. Some wonderful words by Jeremiah. He says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in Him. The Lord is good to those who wait for Him, to the soul who seeks Him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man who bears his yoke in his youth. These are some amazing words by Jeremiah. The words that give us hope. The words that comfort us. The words that encourage us. And as true as these words are, and as true as they were for Jeremiah, how much truer are they for us? I think it's important that we remember the context out of which Jeremiah is speaking these words. It's written in the book of Lamentations. And what is he lamenting? The destruction of Jerusalem and the temple by the Babylonians the third time. As he looks at his homeland, his family and friends either dead or carried off into captivity, His beloved temple and city destroyed, lying in ruins. And as he laments all that has happened in the judgment of God, he looks around and he says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It is his faithfulness. If it was true for Jeremiah then, how much truer is it for us who have the mystery of God revealed to us that we have Christ in us, the hope of glory? Right? Look at what Peter says in 1 Peter. He addresses this. Starting in verse 3, chapter 1, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy, which He has caused to be born in us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, unfading, undefiled, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power is being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last times. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the testing genuineness of your faith, though more precious than gold, though it may be tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not yet seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and unfilled with glory. The obtaining and outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied 
about the grace that was to be yours, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person and what time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating, then present, predicting it, the suffering of Christ and the subsequent glory. And it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things in which angels longed to look. So Peter references the fact that the prophets like Jeremiah long to look into these things, long to understand the fullness of Christ in us, the hope of glory. And it gave them hope. And how much for us? Right? It gives us hope. We have a confident assurance that one day we will be with God in paradise. Like I've said before, it does not undercut, it does not make little of your suffering now. Your suffering is real. It's hard. It's okay to be honest about that. We need to be honest about that. It does nobody any good to whitewash, to sugarcoat, to airbrush our lives. Right? That does nobody any good except everyone thinks, well, I'm the only one who's struggling. I'm the only one who's hurting. I'm the only one who finds this type of situation I find myself in hard. No, we all find it hard. Let's be honest. But we also need to understand that we have hope. And that hope transforms. And some of us as Christians, we walk around defeated. Because by golly, we have hope. And I don't know that I can get to bed anymore. Because it's just too hard. We have hope, brothers and sisters. Let's live that way. Let's let our faces know that. We sit in the pews and say, sing and be happy. And we never let our face know it. We don't communicate it to our brothers and sisters in Christ. We don't walk through those doors and cry on each other's shoulders, pick ourselves up and say, you know what? We have a hope of glory that's come. God is faithful in His promises. We need to. We need to encourage one another. And we need to let our demeanor reflect the fact that we have hope. We have a confident assurance of what will one day be. And that should affect our now. It definitely affects our future. But Peter's not done. Look there in verse 13 and following. He says, therefore, he says, prepare your minds for action. Be sober-minded. Set your hope fully upon the grace that, is, that will be brought to you at the res- re- revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, so you also are called to conduct yourself as holy. Right? You also are to be holy. Peter calls us to be people of action. People who serve. Our hope calls us not just to change our demeanor, not to change the way in which our faces look and the way in which we handle these trials, though that's true. But these, this hope that we have causes us to be people of action, people of service, people who impact our community. And as I was looking at this concept and as I was looking for photos for the PowerPoint this morning, I came across these and I'm like, those are awesome. You know what? That should have a church's name on them. Not the Rotary Club. Because we are called to be people of action. We are called to be people who are called to transform lives. To connect with others. That's what we are called to do. And instead of letting our light shine, we batten down the hatches. We walk around defeated because there's a foot of sunshine outside. Because we have hope. Woe is me, I have hope. Right? I, I, we got to let ourselves know this. So as we look then at the words of Peter, we see that we're called to action. We have hope. But we also see that we're called to live righteous lives because of it. The way that we conduct ourselves changes. We don't in, indulge in all the things of this world. We understand that there's something more. And because of that, we live righteously. We live with righteousness. So how do we take all this and how do we apply it to our life? 
Well, the first thing I need to ask you is, do you have hope? Do you have hope? If you have been baptized into Christ, if you have been saved, if you've been united with Him, you have hope. And if you have not, if you have not been united with Christ, if you are not in a relationship with Him, if you're not following Him, if you haven't died to yourself and rise to walk a new life, then you do not have hope. And I want to encourage you to sit down with me or one of the elders or one of the deacons or one of the other many guys here who would love to sit down and study with you and we'll buy you a cup of coffee, we'll meet at a place of your convenience, at a time of your convenience, and we will seek to open up this book and let it speak to you and you can make a decision of whether or not you think this actually brings hope. And I encourage you to make that decision today. To begin to look, begin to question, to begin to wrestle with this thing if you don't have hope. For the rest of us, hope, we do have hope. We have been united with Christ. We have hope. And I think there's several things that, as a result, we should be doing. As a result of the hope that we have, we should be people who are showing it. We should show our hope by the way we carry ourselves. We should not walk around defeated. When we sing, sing and be happy, we should be happy because we have hope. We have Christ. We live in a wonderful time, in a wonderful place, with a wonderful hope. And Christ is 2,000 years closer than He was at first. Amen? Amen. So are you letting it show on your face? Are you serving others? Is your hope motivating you to serve others? To share that light? To share that hope? Are you? Are you living your life in light of of eternity or as people of hope are you living as if you have none keeping your light bottled up and brothers and sisters if we're going to reach our community for Christ if we're going to share our faith it starts with a demeanor that doesn't walk around defeated we're not yours some of us are naturally inclined that way right ask my mom Next time she's here, ask her. I was a Eeyore walk around the house. I'm fine. Right? That's just my demeanor. But you know what? In Christ, that changes. Or at least it's supposed to. And we need to walk around with a confident hope that causes us to serve and to love others and to face the trials of today differently than the world. We mourn, but not as the world does. Because we have hope. We have confidence. We have assurance. And we need to let that show.